So welcome on behalf of authors at Google. I'm really excited today to bring you Chris Dixon to talk about his new book, Ghost Wave, The Discovery of Cortez Bank and the Biggest Wave on Earth. Chris is the founding editor of surfermag.com. He once spent a year documenting the wildlife of another author, author that we've hosted here, Jimmy Buffett. Uh, and his work has appeared in many publications, including the New York Times, Outside, Men's Journal, Popular Mechanics, Surfer, and Surfer's Journal. He lives in Charleston, South Carolina, and I'm wondering how the surfing is there. Actually, it can be pretty good. Actually, okay, okay. And um, some friends have tagged along with Chris today, and I'm going to let him introduce, you, introduce them and tell you more about them. So the uh, other point is, remember that we have a remote audience, so when you want to ask a question, we'll need to get a mic to you so they can hear it or the speaker can repeat the uh, question. So now welcome in, well, join me in welcoming Chris Dixon. Um, thank you guys a lot for coming. This is a, this is a real honor. I, uh, I used Google a lot in uh, researching this book um, in ways that I didn't even expect to. And uh, so to be able to actually you know, come here and talk to you guys and, and maybe even tell you a little bit about how I used, how, how I used some, some, some Google in some ways, was, uh, it was pretty cool. Um, this book is obviously, uh, it's, it's called Ghost Wave, The Discovery of Cortez Bank and the Biggest Wave on Earth. And uh, I became really fascinated um, in, the, in the bank early on in, in 2001 after a group of guys that one of whom is, is here in the, in, up here in the front with me went out and the photographer, actually two guys are here, the photographer Rob Brown and Ken Skin Dog Collins, who's a well-known Maverick surfer, uh, went out and rode these waves that, that nobody even knew existed back in 2001. And uh, I'm gonna stop real quick and just tell you that the other guys that I have with me are Greg Long, a uh, big wave surfer from San Clemente, Jason Murray, um, Skinny, Jeff Clark of Mavericks Renown and, and Rob Brown, and, and they'll be available to answer some questions afterwards too, because the book wouldn't have been possible without the, the help and, uh, and uh, just amazing work that these guys have done through the years uh, conquering big waves around the world. Uh, so I'll uh, start with showing you a pulled back picture of this wave at, at Cortez on January 5th, 2008. This is actually stretched a bit, so this wave is, it, it's actually bigger than this. Um, if you were looking at it in a real regular perspective, you know, perhaps, I don't know, 65, 70 feet high. This is uh, Grant Baker, who's one of Greg's best friends. He's a South African, and uh, he's also very well known in the Mavericks community. Um, the, the Cortez Bank is a, is a really unusual underwater feature. And it was first explored by sort of the, the group of surfers who, who now go out there on a, on a regular basis or, or started going out there on a regular basis around the, the turn of the century by uh, a group of guys that included uh, Larry, Larry Moore, who everyone knew as Flame. He was the photo editor of, of Surfing Magazine. And Larry developed a real mania to chart spots off the California coast that, that he thought might have waves. And this included uh, the outer Channel Islands, um, San Nicolas and San Clemente. And, and then um, he, he became sort of fixated along with uh, two other guys that he worked with at Surfing Magazine, Bill Sharp, who is right here. And Bill is, as these guys know, is the sometimes contentious, always entertaining director of the Billabong XXL Big Wave Awards. Bill and uh, Sam George, who was a director of the film Riding Giants that some of you guys may have seen, Bill and Sam and Flame eyeballed this spot off the California coast, way off the California coast. You can see this is the Southern California Bight here, San Clemente, Catalina, San Nicolas, and then I'm gonna zoom and show you uh, the Cortez and Tanner Banks. These are, these are really strange underwater features. Um, they're essentially sunken channel islands. They're not little seamounts. They're, they're, they're really big. Um, if you were to measure Cortez from here to here in the, the Shola stretch, it's about 15 miles long. And the waters off of Cortez drop to 1,000 fathoms or 6,000 feet. What that translates into for a surfer is a spot that's capable of taking wave energy and focusing it almost like a lens through a, like sunlight through a magnifying glass. Um, 
on this very shallow pinnacle here called the Bishop Rock, which is uh, various depending on the tides. Um, the shallowest point of Bishop Rock comes to within 12 to 15 feet of the surface. Even further complicating thing, they, things they saw on the map here, a, a half fathom, a half fathom of, uh, of water over one spot. And that, was, that looked like a wreck, a shipwreck. So there's a shipwreck that's covered by three feet of water out there. They didn't really know what that meant. All they knew was that they thought that it could generate a wave. Um, the first person that they asked about this, the first person that Flame actually asked about the potential for there to be waves out at Cortez was a gentleman named Philip Flippy Hoffman. Some of you may have heard of Christian and Nathan Fletcher. Um, this is Christian and Nathan Fletcher's great uncle. who He passed away this past year. And he was a renowned big wave surfer, one of the first people to surf a, a frightening wave off the westernmost point of Oahu called Kaina Point. Flippy used to fish out off the Cortez Bank in the 50s for abalone. He would join a number of other, of other big wave surfers who were, they, they could get $6 or so per abalone, and so they were, they were pulling in really good money because you could get 40 or 50 dozen abalone in a day. Um, Flippy described the bank as a very rough place to try to sleep at night cups and plates would fly across the galley. I knew sometimes it must get really big out there, but he never surfed it. So they were all, they, were, they, they weren't able to confirm with anybody had anybody ever actually surfed out there. This is sort of what Flippy described to them though. He described this beautiful place of just cerulean water, um, massive schools of sardine and menhaden, kelp forest, and bat rays, huge bat rays uh, swimming along on the bottom and then urchins and abalone just littering the seafloor, a real underwater Eden, but also obviously a, a, a place of considerable danger. Um, these photos were taken by a guy named Terry Moss, who, who spearfishes out there a great deal, and he's actually set a few world records um, atop the bank spearfishing. <laughs> this is what they were fishing for, abalone, these huge self shellfish that are very tasty. The other person that Flippy had talked to almost sort of independently of, of Flame, at least early on, was a guy named Sean Collins. And Sean is, is generally sort of considered surfing's media, one true media mogul these days. He runs a, a big surf forecasting site called surfline.com. And Sean also talked to Flippy, and Flippy basically described the same thing. Um, and Sean had also talked to some other fishermen out there, another fisherman in particular who said that he'd actually seen a really good surfable looking wave out there. Well, Sean developed a, a real um, insatiable need to understand where waves came from, how they worked, why they came in sets, um, why the sets had different spacings and what the different angles were. And he turned that eventually into a very successful surf forecasting business because he's just, com if you talk to Sean, he's still today completely obsessed with understanding the propagation of waves across the ocean. This was a chart that he drew early on where he was trying to, it was just a hand-drawn chart that looked at, at the chart guide where he was actually looking at the bathymetry, the underwater topography out there and figuring out, okay, what happens when a wave comes across the Cortez Bank, what would be the ideal direction? Should it be a swell that comes from a storm way up to the north? Should it be a storm to the south? Should it be a storm, you know, um, right off the California coast? And he kind of keeps the, the, best, uh, the best of these angles a secret. Um, eventually, Flame, Bill Sharp, Sam George, and a pro from Laguna named George Hulse rode out on an incredibly um, secret mission. They didn't tell anybody. They went out, on, and, uh, and this is George Hulse's first paddling wave atop the Cortez Bank. There was no such thing as what's known as toe surfing today back in uh, 1990. When they rode this, when they rode these waves, but you can imagine they're a hundred miles out in the ocean. There's no land anywhere. All there is is this this shallow sea mount, and they're in the middle of the open ocean. It's very difficult to even catch a wave out there, much less uh, try to predict where the next one was going to come from. And as you can imagine, they also got steamrolled by by several sets. Uh, but it, this was as, this is generally considered about as small as Cortez is able to break. This is maybe eight feet you know, can, what surfers would consider eight feet from top to bottom. If it's any smaller than this, the waves just sort of generally pass over the bank and, uh, and, and don't even break. And then they just continue on to California. Um, Sam George described it as the most fantastic feeling we had found Flames Moby Dick. Um, 
in, in researching the history of the bank, a, uh, I think it was a, a, a geologist or, or um, a geologist or an archaeologist, I couldn't remember which, who actually pointed out to me that Cortez actually was, was an island not very long ago. Um, as, as recently as 10,000 years ago, it was a big island. It was about 14 miles long. And it's very likely that it would have been walked upon, hunted upon, by the native Americans who lived on San Clemente Island 40 miles away. They regularly paddled these huge distances between all the Channel Islands. And so it wouldn't have been a stretch for them at all to have paddled from Tanner Island or Cortez Island. And here we can see a map that shows the, the contours of the coast um, 10 and 12,000 years ago. Uh, 12,000 years ago, all of the northern um, Channel Islands, Santa Rosa, Santa Cruz, the ones off of Santa Barbara, were actually a single island that were inhabited by, a, by a, a tribe of woolly mammoths that swam over there at some point in, the his, in history. Um, and then this shows, this, the black is 10,000 years ago, the, the gray is 12,000 years ago. There was even a tiny island called North, that they called North Cortez 12,000 years ago. But 10,000 or so years ago is when Native Americans would have first gone out there. And um, they would have, <coughs> they would have, they, you know, they lived on San Clemente, and this is, this is the, the western shoreline of San Clemente, and it shows these million-year-old-plus wave-scoured terraces along San Clemente. This sort of gives you an idea of what the, what the topography off of Cortez looks like. Um, the, the varying sea levels through the, through the millennia have created these stair steps, and each of these flat stair step spots is a spot where the sea level remained fairly constant for a while, and it, and it scoured out these, uh, these ridges. They would have gotten there on what are called tomoles or tiot plank canoes, um, and they would have these these folks were as as solid a seafarers as you could have ever hoped to find. Surely as much so as as Hawaiians. And there's even I've even read some thought that there's cross pollination between Polynesian and and Californian culture. When they went out to Tanner Banks, which was the nearer of the islands, this is essentially what they would have seen. This was provided to me by. Rick Kavitek at California State University Monterey Bay, they would have seen a, 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 a hilltop of, of about a hundred foot high bluff in red, then 75 to 100 foot high um, ring around a beautiful lagoon that would have just been a, a paradisical place to fish. There would have been just incredible sea life in that lagoon. And, um, and then this would have been looking from North Cortez to South Cortez and you can see how quickly the seafloor drops off. Um, interestingly, this is the western flank of Cortez where the swells, where the big swells approach from. Here you see some blank spots in the map. That's because when Mr. Gavitek was uh, mapping the seafloor, um, he actually had a whale clip off his, uh, his sonar sounder, so he wasn't able to get, to get there the whole way. Um, the, I obviously was interested in the history of who discovered the Cortez Bank? You know, where, when was, why is it named what it is, et cetera. Um, the general truth is, that's accepted is that a ship called the Cortez, a side wheel steamer um, that passed along the coast in, eight, in the 1850s carrying 49ers to San Francisco was the first ship to have ever seen waves atop the bank. This is an ad actually from the New York Times in 1853. The um, captain of the ship on this actual passage that's advertised on this very ship right here, reported seeing, as he passed this bank, he said the waters were in violent commotion thrown up suddenly into columns at regular intervals of four to five minutes. Because of that, that would have represented a big shipping hazard. You know, you, had, you were seeing thousands of people ferried um, every week to San Francisco to head into the mountains to, to look for gold. So officers of the United States Coast Survey would have been dispatched out there to the middle of the ocean with basically a sink line with lead on the end of it to go and, and try to find this thing out in the, and they would have given them a rough idea, Cropper would have, but it would have been very difficult to actually find this place out in the middle of the ocean. Um, but it was found um, by the officers of the Coast Survey in, in 1853, and this is the first map. Interestingly enough, though, they missed the spot that is surfed today, the spot called the Bishop Rock, and that was reportedly found by a clipper ship called the SS Bishop. And this is an advertisement um, that appeared in the Daily Alta, advertising passage on the Bishop around Cape Horn to New York City. This ship still holds a record for the fastest sailing trip from the, the east to west coast. 
and you could have booked it in California Street in San Francisco. This is the bishop. Now, the legend has it that the bishop um, struck a rock out in the middle of the ocean. I'll back it up. When the, the, the bishop struck a rock out in the middle of the ocean and that this was the bishop rock. And, uh, and it somehow limped back to San Francisco, battered and torn. But I've been able to find no verification of that. And I actually had a guy named Steve Lawson, who's a pretty well-known treasure hunter in Orange County, who's, who's looked at a lot of ships basically say, you know, I don't see any record of the ship actually hitting it. So what we have hypothesized is that the ship actually probably saw waves out there and the, and the story became conflated over time that it actually hit the rock. So then the question came to me, well, okay, was there any earlier record? And interestingly enough, a guy named James Alden, who was a commander with the Coast Survey and was a, a real world traveler, he had visited, he, he traveled all over the world aboard the USS Constitution. When the Mexican-American War started in the 1840s, Alden was aboard the USS Constitution, and it sailed from um, Hawaii to Monterey. And, uh, and on, I believe it was January 5th of 1846, as they, as they left Monterey Bay and sailed south, they discovered breakers bearing northeast about 10 miles distant. And this would have been the time that you would have seen big waves on the Cortez Bank. So I kind of postulate that the bank should actually be called the Constitution Bank because it was discovered by old Ironsides, which is still afloat in Philadelphia today. Then the other, the other you know, really interesting story that, at least to me, um, was, okay, if the, bishop, if, the, if the bishop didn't actually hit the rock, then maybe it should be named after the guy who actually discovered the rock in 1855. This is the father. I was not able to find a picture of the guy who actually discovered the rock, but this was his father. He was a general in the Confederacy. He was from Wilmington, North Carolina. And the guy's name was Archibald McRae. And um, on November 3rd of 1855, a story appeared in the New York Times, Dangerous Rock Off the Coast of California. McRae spent a couple of miserable weeks out in the middle of the ocean, and he finally found this 12-foot deep rock. And, uh, and then... Um, two weeks later, he blew his brains out in San Francisco Bay, and uh, the uh, the story is pretty tragic. And I was I was pretty shocked when I when I found that out. Um, the I, all of his letters home are at Duke University, and um, they're they're pretty wrenching. They're his letters home during his whole military career, including his his suicide note: "My soul I give to God, and I hope He will make better use of it than I have." Whether or not he's buried in Wilmington actually remains a mystery. He had been buried in Yerba Buena, and, uh, which is no longer a cemetery. So moving forward in time, um, I became, you know, okay, who else went to the Cortez Bank? What were some other stories? There were several stories in the Los Angeles Times during the 20s and 30s about coast surveyors and fishermen who had started really discovering the, the waters off the bank. But then in uh, 1957, Mel Fisher, who some of you guys may know as the discoverer of the richest treasure ever found on the seafloor off of Florida, um, he launched his first major treasure hunting expedition out to Cortez. And I actually was able to locate the reporter um, who went out with him on that journey, and we, and we talked about it. And it turned into just a complete fiasco. Their, their boat almost sank on several occasions, and, uh, and they basically didn't find any treasure. Um, but this was the start of the start of Mel Fisher's career, um, and his first mission was Cortez Bank. I thought this was a funny picture. This was provided to me by uh, Jimmy Buffett graciously. This is uh, Mel Fisher in, <clears throat> on July twentieth, nineteen eighty-five, sitting atop gold and silver bars from the Atosha, while Jimmy sings a pirate looks at forty. <laughs> um, and that was actually on the day that that he found the treasure. Um, so, I've. I wanted to know who was the first person to surf out there? Who was actually the first person to catch a wave off the Cortez Bank? I'm not going to say definitively that the gentleman in the center of this photo is the guy who discovered, who, who first surfed out there, but I think it's, I think it's very possible. Um, his name is, is Harrison Ely, and he is an absolute hoot. He lives in Oceanside. He is a real adventurer who spent his early years sailing between Mexico, Hawaii, and California, and hardly anybody's ever heard of him. He was, I was put onto him by a guy named Mickey Munoz, who's a well-known um, surfer in his 70s, and he, he still charges every day in San Clemente. In this photograph are another um, big wave surfer named Wayne Schaefer, 
over here to the left. And this is Phil Edwards, who is the first guy to have ever been documented surfing pipeline. And they're riding on Philip Flippy Hoffman's catamaran. They're testing a catamaran that, that Flippy built, um, taking it down to trestles. Um, so uh, Mickey put me on to Harrison. Harrison showed me this picture of him surfing Waimea, perfect form, dropping in inside of a Waimea legend named Buzzy Trent in 1963. Um, well, Harrison, in 1961, actually carried Phil Edwards to Hawaii um, for the North Shore winter. And a, a week or two later, Phil Ed that's when Phil Edwards was documented um, surfing the pipeline. So Harrison actually carried Phil Edwards to his uh, date with fame at the Bonsai Pipeline. On the way back from Hawaii, on, you know, on this very same trip, Harrison sailed past the Cortez Bank, and it was during the summer, and there was a big south swell in the water, and the weather was very calm, and he saw this wave breaking out in the middle of the ocean, and he said, whoa, I want to go check that out. So he, they pulled the boat up close and anchored it in shallow water, and Harrison basically said, I, I'd been surfing Makaha and Waimea, so it didn't look scary, but then again, it wasn't 50 feet either. I watched it and watched it before I tried to catch one. And eventually he did. He caught a few waves. Then when the tide started to stir the current um, and, and you know, things got a little breezy, he just pulled up anchor and sailed back to California. The, there were a, no, a number of other stories um, about the bank that I, that I found. None of them were sort of more scary than that of this gentleman named Alima Kalama. Um, Alima is the father of Dave Kalama, and, and Alima is a well-known big wave pioneer in his own right. Um, Alima used to abalone fish in the, in the late 60s and early 70s. And in around 1971, I'm pretty sure is what he said, he and a buddy named Larry Doyle were out off the, off the coast at Cortez, and they'd had a huge take of abalone. And they knew that the weather was going downhill, and all the other fishing boats pulled off of the bank and headed back to, headed back to shore. But Alima basically said, I, I got greedy. And he went out, and they decided to stay. Well, in the middle of the night, the weather got rough, the waves got huge, and their boat sank out from underneath them and left he and Larry basically swimming in the middle of the ocean in pitch black dark. And there was, the water was about 49 degrees. Um, as you can imagine, they would have frozen to death very quickly had a few minutes later their wetsuits not popped to the surface like the coffin in Moby Dick. They climbed into their wetsuits, and I'll let you guys read the rest of the story, but it's, if you believe in miracles, the fact that he survived is an absolute one. Um, so in, in moving forward in time, in 1985, there was, I, and I have a feeling, I can't confirm this, but I think that part of the reason that Flame became fixated on the waves of the Cortez Bank was because there had been a report of a ship striking a reef 100 miles off the coast of California in the LA Times. And the story didn't get a whole lot of, of play. There were only, there were only a, few, a few mentions of it. But essentially, I, I was lucky enough to find the commander, um, Robert Leuschner, and he told me about what happened. But basically, the USS Enterprise slammed into a spot very near where the guys surfed today and was nearly sunk. And uh, it, it would be a very different place today, you know, a radioactive waste dump, for one thing, had that, uh, had that actually happened. But um, Mr. Leuschner attributed his, his savior to divine intervention as well. Um, the strangest story that I came upon in, in all of this, and, and one that still has resonance with the surfers today, is a chapter that I called The Kings of Abalonia. In 1966, a story appeared in the Pasadena Independent that was quoted a, a gentleman named Bruce, I think, it, well, his last name was Taggart, I don't remember his first name, but he says, I know it sounds fantastic, but we've consulted experts in international law. They say there's nothing to prevent us from starting our own country if we want to. The Cortez Bank is in international waters off the continental shelf and beyond either U.S. or Mexican jurisdiction. So essentially, the idea was they were going to take a bunch of rocks out and sink them until Cortez Bank was again an island for the first time in thousands of years, plant a flag on it, and declare territorial wa waters um, all the way around the Cortez Bank, which would give them you know, potentially huge um, lucrative fishing rights because it's one of the most prolific fisheries in the Pacific. Uh, so the guy who actually put this, who hatched this plan was an actor named Joe Kirkwood. He was a, a B, sort of a B-movie actor who had played a boxer named Joe Palooka. 
back in the 50s and 60s. And he was very well known at this time because he'd also played in five Masters golf tournaments. I had been, I tried really, really hard to find anybody who'd been attached to this project and was just banging my head against a desk. Um, I couldn't find anybody. And then one day this package comes in the mail anonymously to me that contained a 60 page account that Kirkwood had written of his role in this fiasco. And, and it even included some really interesting film that I'm going to show you guys in a second. But uh, we see that Kirkwood wrote, the newspapers called it Abalonia, although I wanted to call it Lemuria, for Lemuria is to the Pacific what Atlantis is to the Atlantic. I thought it was fitting. The country I was going to build would be deserving of a better name than Abalonia. Um, that was Joe Kirkwood writing in 67. He submitted this story, interestingly, to Sports Illustrated, and he, as I said, he was a really well-known golfer at the time, and why they didn't publish at least a portion of it, I have no idea. Um, in 50, I actually found a photo of Kirkwood that was taken in 1952 in Wilmington, North Carolina, coincidentally, which is where Archibald McRae, who discovered uh, Kirkwood's nation-building site, um, was from. And this photo is of him and his wife, actress Kathy Downs, um, who was the Azalea Queen that year. This photo was actually taken by Archibald McRae's great, great nephew. And had it not been for Google, that knowledge would have never, ever come to light. Um, the, uh, the person that Kirkwood hit up to help him plan this mission was, was one of the best known divers in California in the 1960s. And the reason was that he had been diving Devil's Hole, which is this gash, this little tiny gash that leads almost to an underground sea beneath Death Valley. And this guy, this gentleman, Jim Houts, this is him diving in Devil's Hole. He had set a world record um, by diving over 300 feet deep in Devil's Hole on nothing but compressed air, no mixture or anything. And he was, he was the right man for the job. He was a Navy demolitions expert. He was an expert fisherman. He had been to the Cortez Bank a lot fishing. And uh, so Kirkwood went to him and basically said, I want to build a nation out there. What do you think? And and how it said the idea really got the wheels spinning. It was like, okay, I've got a project here. What will it take to do it? Well, Houts came up with a really interesting, radical idea. There was this ship in the mothball fleet in San Francisco, um, in Oakland actually, called it, that had been badged the Jalisco, and it had come from Mexico. It was built of concrete in the 1940s in Tampa as a World War II freighter. Um, it had been badged the Richard Lewis Humphrey in America and then apparently you know, kind of disappeared to Mexico and then turned back up in the mothball fleet. They bought this ship for $80,000, salvaged most of the parts off of it, and um, this is actually footage of it being, being towed to the Cortez Bank beneath the Bay Bridge. So there's some interesting uh, San Francisco connections to this, uh, to this story that have absolutely nothing to do with, uh, with surfing at all. But, um, this was actually it being carried down, and you can see the, the, the concrete hull. And uh, this is the tug that, that carried it all the way down there, over 300 miles. Um, when they got there, everything was going according to plan, but then there were several communication snafus and miscues, and they got the, they got the ship sort of positioned atop the Bishop Rock. And then things started to go haywire. And the reason that they did is because this was, of course, November. And their Houts had noticed a big storm brewing off, off the coast of Japan. But it looked like it was days and days out. And what he failed to calculate was the fact that swells from these storms propagate way ahead of the storms. And they run way, way faster. So th as they got the, storm into this, the ship into position, seas were calm as a lake. Within about an hour and a half, they were battling waves 50 feet high atop the bank. They came in out of nowhere. This is Joe Kirkwood perched on the bow of his great ship of state um, as uh, it is about to be submerged. Um, he said there was an enormous wall of blue-green water rising 45 feet or more, the fish in it plainly visible. This superstructure is, is four stories tall, so what you're looking at is the back of a breaking wave. Kirkwood is looking up at a wave 30 to, 30 to 40 feet high, and it's getting ready to take him out. Now, the boys who surf out there didn't realize that this ship was there. They knew that there was a ship there, but they didn't realize exactly where it was. 
This is Kirkwood after he's been liberated from the ship. He's in the water. Jim Houts, the gentleman in that other photo, is standing behind the superstructure here. He had been trying to get Joe to let go of the mast and come back there with him. And uh, the fact that, that these guys survived, again, is like, it, it's unbelievable. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm astonished that uh, nobody's, nobody that I found has actually died atop the bank. This wave is even bigger. As you can see, it's burying the entire um, superstructure of the ship. And, uh, and several of these guys, actually all these guys are intimately familiar with this exact spot. This is a little bit later, and we can see that the superstructure has been completely blown off the ship by the waves. And this is a, a breaking wave on the shallow spot of the Bishop Rock. Today, um, this was a couple of years afterwards, these guys went diving in the hole of the Jalisco, which is, as I said, still down there. And they're, what's it known for now is lots of big, big lobsters. So. Um, I'm sure you guys are, are now, you know, as, as I've been dragging this story out, interested. Okay, then where do these waves come from? Uh, the waves that sweep over places like Mavericks, the Cortez Bank, Todos Santos, Pescadero Point, and Carmel, also known as Ghost Tree, um, are, are, they come from massive storms that generally sweep off of Siberia and get, get pulled up into the warm waters of the Japan current and sort of go nuclear as, they, as the, the mixture between the cold and, and warm ocean currents causes huge storms to spin up. Um, in 1933, this gentleman, um, it says James Whitemarsh, his name was actually R.P. Whitemarsh, that's a typo on my part, um, went, went into the middle of one of these storms aboard a, that, this ship called the Ramapo that you saw in the previous picture and went over a wave that is still the biggest ever recorded in the open ocean, a wave 112 feet high. And I actually found his daughter living in Honolulu. She's 88, and, and she really helped me kind of spin the story of an incredible guy. He was, he was the guy who actually sank the Japanese mini-sub in Pearl Harbor in the hours before the attack and, and had been a, an, an officer on a ship in World War II that had been sunk from beneath him. He led just an incredible life. Um, so what White Marsh basically experienced, and I know there's some engineers in here, so hopefully you can get your heads around this, this graphic. When you have a long, long fetch of, uh, of wind across the water, you can see it when wind's blowing even across you know, San Francisco Bay, you'll see these tiny little ripples start to form. The longer that wind blows, the bigger those, rip the bigger those ripples get until by the time you're 25 miles offshore, you can have a 10-foot wave with a, that, that takes, if you were standing, if you were on a boat in a single spot, that wave would take seven seconds to pass you by. As those waves get bigger and bigger, they get faster and faster. Their, their periods or wavelengths increase dramatically until by the time you're five miles offshore with a 40 knot continual wind, you'd be looking at a wave that would take 15 seconds to pass you that would, have, that would be 15 feet high and would go down below the surface of the ocean, its energy column 575 feet. As you get longer and longer stretches, the waves just get bigger and bigger and bigger until at the end of 2,000 miles, that wave would be 37 feet high with a 20-second period, and it would go down to 1,000 feet below the surface of the ocean. That's, that doesn't mean that it would be as powerful here as it would here, but you would have an energy column that far down. Now, you know, how could a 112-foot wave happen? Well, basically, as I understand it, I'm not the oceanographer, but as it was explained to me, these waves they're not, they don't follow sort of tidy laws of physics. And one wave might be, you might have a, a 37 sec, a 37 foot wave actually run over the top of a 15 foot wave. And when that happens, you can get a, 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 what you would consider a rogue wave, a, ro a wave that's temporary, but that builds up far, far bigger than its, than its brothers and sisters. And if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, as Sean Collins, the forecaster, described to me, you can end up with a perfect storm scenario. It's just that not a lot of boats are there to actually see that happen. And when they do, the results can be catastrophic. Um, but it happens all the time. You, you think that this must be a rare occurrence. At any one time, there was a, um, I believe it was a, a, a European Space Agency study that found that there were seven or eight waves like this coursing through the oceans on an average day any, at any one time. Um, so that gives you somewhat of an idea, and then this is a, this is a famous photo that's just on the internet, thanks to Google, um, of a ship facing a wave that's maybe 80 feet behind them. So you can imagine what a 112-footer must have looked like. But it swept beneath them, 
and the ship surfed down it for a while, and then it kept going. And, uh, and, and then, you know, what, so what happens when a wave like that hits the Cortez Bank? This was a graphic that was provided to me, courtesy of Sean Collins and Surfline. Here we see the Bishop Rock and the, the way that it sort of sticks up out here. But then you see this just abyssal drop off off of the Cortez Bank. It goes, it drops down, as I said, to 6,000 feet. So a wave that comes up has nowhere to go but up because it's been coursing through the ocean at 1,000 feet of depth. And it, it climbs these stair steps off of Bishop Rock and, and can become essentially, you know, what is generally recognized now as the, the biggest rideable, surfable, perfect wave on the face of the earth. In 1990, Flame, the, the photographer, flew over the Cortez Bank with his buddy Mike Castillo in the days right before, the, uh, right before they made their first surf mission. And they took these photos from an airplane. They were actually flying at sea level, looking way, way up at these waves. And Sean Collins went and backtracked this swell and said that these waves are 80 to 90 feet high. Um, and because they didn't have any point of reference, they didn't know how big they actually were. But Sean reckons that these were, were 80 to 90 foot waves. And as you can see, um, Mike Castillo told Flame, if, ever, if anyone ever tries to surf out there, they better bring the blanking Pope along to pray for them. And of course, eventually guys did. Here's a shot from the air um, of one of Flame's 17 or 18 flyovers at various times of the Cortez Bank on swells. He became just obsessed, fixated with trying to figure out when the Cortez Bank broke the best, what were the best conditions. As the surfers in this crowd would, would, would agree, these are not ideal conditions for Cortez Bank. This is actually not a huge swell by Cortez standards, and it's, and it's pretty windy and choppy out there. But you can see the right-handed wave just peeling off in the distance, and that's what, that's what these guys are after out there. Is you see two waves following each other in succession, and uh, that's what they became obsessed with. Um, in the late 1990s, uh, toe surfing really sort of started to take off. And for those of you who, who have seen it, it's pretty darn spectacular. Uh, it was the f among the first people to, to, to do it at all were, were generally regarded to be the, the Hawaiians, Laird, Laird Hamilton, Dave Kalama, Derek Dorner, some of their friends. And uh, the waves that they rode at a spot off of the coast of Maui and also a spot called Log Cabins off of Oahu were just generally considered a quantum leap. And it wasn't long before guys like these boys in the front, Jeff Clark and Skinny in particular, um, took up that mantle to see if you could do that at, at Mavericks. And of course they realized in short order that it was quite possible. Um, one of Rob Brown, the photographer here, one of his good friends growing up was this little, this little skinny ripper named Mike Parsons. And, Rob described him as this skinny redheaded stepchild with freckles with his perfect wetsuit sponsor's logo airbrushed on it and he pulled these perfect off the lips. We tried to vibe him, but he outsurfed us so bad that it just didn't matter. Well, in 2001, after several aborted missions, the conditions finally came together for uh, Mike and the boys to maybe go out to Cortez Bank. And um, Mike had just been an obsessed big wave surfer. This is him at Toto Santos during the 80s. And this was one of the first sort of bona fide big waves that it was realized existed off the California coast. Of course, Mavericks would soon, would soon follow. Um, Mike, Mike was enemies with this guy, Brad Gerlach. Um, Mike was sort of your Richie Cunningham of, of professional surfing, while Brad was this flashy punk. I kind of compare him to Corey Haim in The Lost Boys. I don't know if any of you guys have ever seen that movie. He was just this brash, outrageous, hilarious. And, uh, and Brad said to me, I'd see him and just be like, Parsons, like this guy's really going to beat me. Well, eventually, after they quit competi competitive surfing, they became best friends, and they took up, the, they took up toe surfing. And, um, and here was a, this was a story that Jeff Clark was gracious enough to grant me an interview for way back in the day that I wrote for New the New York Times back in 2002 when, this, when the, the sport really first started to, to come on. And, and of course, as a lot of you guys realize, there's been this controversy over jet skis in the water around Mavericks and, and off the California coast ever since. Um, this is uh, Skin Dog, who's here in the audience, and Peter Mel, who is, of course, a well-known Maverick surfer, and Josh Loya um, also. Well, in 2001, let me back that up. In 2001, Flame contacted Skin Dog, Peter Mel, Parsons and Gerlach and said, hey, I see something on the charts here. 
you guys need to get down. We're going to, we're going to go to this spot out in the middle of the ocean. And you can imagine Skinny's wife was a little um, apprehensive and he had a pretty funny discussion with her that appears in the book. But this is what they found. This is an aerial shot that was taken by flame. You, we can see Rob Brown's boat, one of the jet skis, and then the other boat that was, that was being, that had been rented by um, filmmaker Dana Brown for the film Step Into Liquid. Uh, this is Rob. This is a photo I took of Rob up, up on the deck of his boat. This is Parsons, also known as Parsnips or Snips, and, and Gerlach. And uh, now these two guys right here, um, this is Evan Slater and John Walla. They actually tried to paddle in on this day. Evan was an was a editor at Surfing Magazine, and he, was, he wasn't sure what he thought about toe surfing. And, and as these guys will, will attest, Evan's a lunatic. Um, he will try to paddle into anything. And this is John Walla on the right, who actually took Greg Long on his first trip ever to, Corte over to, ever to Toto Santos. And uh, Johnny's one of these guys like Harrison Ely. He's, if you're a big wave surfer, you knew who he was. If you weren't, you didn't have a clue who he was. Johnny actually scared the bejesus out of uh, Skinny and Pete because he was only, what, 19 years old and he was the captain of the boat. And, uh, you know, so, and then he tried to paddle in out here. Um, so here's a picture of John trying to punch through a wave out there and Evan Slater's about 100 yards inside of him about to wear this wave on the head. Um, eventually Mike and Brad traded places and this was Mike's first ever ride <laughs> at uh, Cortez. Uh, let me back up to that to what Rob Brown told me about this because it's pretty it's pretty funny. I was just sitting there going click 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 watching the counter go down frame by frame telling myself relax Mike is gonna die right here and right now but you're gonna do your job. Rob's job was to capture Mike's first ever world record wide at the Cortez Bank. This is an aerial photo of that same wave. You can see this tiny little speck, and that's Mike Parsons. And I believe, Skinny, you had a ringside seat to this wave, yeah? Um, this is Mike's proud mama. <laughs> this is some footage that was provided to me courtesy of Dana Brown, who was the director of the film Step Into Liquid, who at the last minute was able to charter this ship and he went out. Um, I highly encourage any of you guys to, to rent this film. It, it's, it's a really interesting look at, at surfing at, during the time that, that toe surfing was first starting to blow up. And this was a real, obviously a coup for Dana to get out and, and capture this. And you can see how they're whipping each other into the waves with the help of the skis. And then we see uh, John Wallace trying to punch the wave right there. That's not something that's even mentioned in the film, but that was the scariest moment of both of their lives. That's Brad Gerlach. And this is Mike's wave. I remember, you know, he was telling me, I was just thinking this thing's going to drop forever. He was, a, he was just thinking it was just going to keep going, never let him off. <coughs> Rob, is that your boat in the foreground? Yeah, that's your old one. Um, so, as you guys can, can imagine, um, after this footage came out and, and, and Jaws was being ripped and torn by Laird Hamilton and his buddies and Jeff Clark and Skinny and the other boys, toe surfing really took off. And uh, in 2003, uh, Mike Parsons and, and Brad uh, tapped Greg Long and his brother Rusty to go out to Cortez on a sort of similar sized swell, but on a day that was even glassier and cleaner. I mean, literally a surreal day when the ocean was just as calm as a mirror and Rob Brown was fortunate enough to 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 get the call to haul him out there and this is uh this is Rob's photo that also became um Greg's first cover shot on Surfer Magazine ever and he's had a few since this is actually video footage that was shot by um Rob's good friend of that wave and it's been seen very few times until now You 
see Greg's kind of happy. I, I told Greg I think my head would explode if I rode a wave like that. Now, during the time that, that toe surfing was, of course, really coming on, Mike Parsons and Brad Gerlach decided they wanted to try to surf Jaws for the first time in their lives. They got on a way too small jet ski and headed, headed down um, in, in the dark. And when they got there, this is what they found. Um, and Mike, basically, Mike and Brad gave me a hilarious accounting of this uh, in the book. Um, Mike said, when I saw it bend at me, I just figured, well, you're really done. You've just gone as far as you, you just got to go as far as you can go. Filming this was, this was being filmed for this contest, the Toe the, the to and World Cup. But as Bill Sharp told me, when he actually saw the footage, he realized it was the best piece of footage ever shot of big wave surfing ever. And he put it at the beginning of his film, Billabong Odyssey. Um, I've, I've tried to count up all the iterations that this video has been watched on YouTube from the film Billabong Odyssey. And one version of it called Struck in Tsunami has been viewed something like 37 million times, and it's probably in 60 or so other iterations across YouTube. Therefore, I would easily say that this is the most downloaded surf film on the internet. And you're, whoops, let me back it up so you can see why. Okay, here we go. Have you, who's not seen this? Raise your hand. Okay, you're in for a treat. This is not photoshopped. <laughs> this is Mike's second ever wave at Jaws. The first one happened moments earlier. See, he almost wipes out right there and manages to pull it together. Eventually, he did get ragdolled, but by then the wave had had, uh, had expended so much of his energy, he was able to uh, to live to surf again. Um, moving forward in time, in G you guys may remember in January of 2008, or, and, and even before, there was in 2007, late 2007, there was a massive storm that provided some of the biggest waves uh, ever seen off the California coast at Mavericks and Pescadero Point, you know, also known as Ghost Tree, and then and then later down at Todos Santos. But a month later, an even bigger storm um, roared in, and this storm actually left more people power, without power in San Francisco than, than I think any storm ever. And it, was, and it was one of, if not the strongest storm ever recorded off the Pacific coast. And somehow, um, Greg Long and Mike Parsons were able to convince Rob Brown to take his boat out into the teeth of that storm and in, in, a, in gale force winds in the, in the hope that they would be able to get a brief window of calm weather out atop the Cortez Bank. The buoys, the data buoys offshore had recorded the biggest swell ever uh, hitting them. And, and excuse me, Greg and the boys just, Greg and Mike <coughs> and Brad and Greg's best friend, um, Twiggy Baker, had to see it. And, uh, and Rob Brown was scared to death, but he, uh, he went for it. Um, this is what they found. This is, look, this is sitting off the side of the Bishop Rock looking at a wave perhaps 80 feet high. And I like this quote from Archibald McRae who discovered the Bishop Rock. This was him looking into the, into the um, caldera at Kilauea. He said, when foolhardiness would urge me to go and peep into some yawning chasm, my conscience would appear to say, stop, you're trifling with the Almighty. That's what I think is arguable that these guys did. This is uh, Gerlach, as you can see, the seasickness patch on his, on his neck, and he was really battling it. And, um, and he, had a, he, had a, he had a rough ride out there. An even rougher ride was had by the videographer, Matt Wybinga, who his footage was almost essentially unusable. I've been fortunate enough to see it, and it's just, it's terrifying, but it would make you seasick just looking at it. And Matt threw up probably 20 or 30 times on this mission, as I understand it. This is uh, Greg and Mike 
trying to figure out what exactly they're going to do. Um, Mike said, the only time I've ever been nearly as scared to ride a wave was at Jaws, but this, the consequences were just so heavy. It was so ominous and overwhelming. This is Brad after getting towed into his first wave, and <laughs> I was going, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. <laughs> So he, he still regrets not going for this wave, but, but Greg has pointed out to him that had he wiped out, he probably would have died, and the, the chances of a wipeout were very high. This is Brad on a later wave. This is, uh, Greg, help me out here. This is Mike Parsons. This is Greg on a huge wave. This is Mike again. And you can see it just, the conditions just became bluebird, at least for a short amount of time. And then, and then eventually the storm roared back in, but not before. This iconic moment was captured by Rob Brown of Mike Parsons on what is regarded as the biggest wave ever ridden, ever documented. Usually you don't see this wave pulled all the way back, but you can see this whitewater eruption is absolutely gigantic. And here's the shot of Twiggy that's on the book cover. And Greg and Twig were basically describing a, a sensation, a condition where they were so amped on adrenaline that their bodies were essentially overdosing every single time they'd ride a wave. And they were, Greg uh, rode a wave that everyone agrees was actually bigger than the one in, that, that Mike is photographed on. And after he rode it, he threw up because he was so, he was so just basically jacked up. Twiggy threw up on every single wave he rode. <laughs> And he described it as, as far as you could see, the inside here, it was just a huge square of white water. If you lost your guy in there, he was just gone. He would have been lost in that expanse, and you'd never find him. It was just so scary. So the book ends with that mission, chapter-wise. But as some of you guys know, and some of you guys look like surfers out here, um, toe surfing has toe surfing has spawned another revolution in surfing. And it's almost a, a regressive revolution in surfing, if you will, because what it's taught the guys is that they can survive beatdowns harder than they ever thought that they could. And with the help of, of skis in particular, they can, pat, they can perhaps paddle into waves that were thought to be unpaddleable at, at sizes that, where the waves move so fast that you just, you know, they thought they couldn't get into them. So Greg is one of the guys who's really been leading that charge along with Skin Dog out at, out at Mavericks and recently at, at Cortez Bank. And I was fortunate to get to go with... Uh, with Greg and a crew that included Mark Healy, Peter Mell of Mavericks, Greg's brother Rusty, and Grant Twiggy Baker um, on this ridiculous yacht in uh, two, uh, the day after Christmas in 2009. And it was gonna be a paddle surfing mission. Um, the conditions were, were set to be just gorgeous and glassy and calm. And um, photographer Jason Murray was out there and these are some of the images that he captured. And I, I just can't stress to you enough how difficult I got to go out on a ski and, and watch this, this happening and the, the waters are so shifty and there's so much current and the waves come, the, at, at a spot like Mavericks, these guys can explain it better, but at a spot like Mavericks, the waves tend to break in a very set spot. At Cortez, they can break 100 yards farther down the reef and, and just absolutely leave these guys scratching for the horizon and bailing their boards as you can see here. I think we have Greg either here or here getting ready to get obliterated and <laughs> Peter Mill paddling um, for the shoulder. And I want to thank Jason who's here for uh, these shots. This is uh, Rusty Long, um, Greg's brother on a bomb and I thought this was a, a gorgeous one. This is some footage that was provided to me courtesy of Bill Sharp um, who runs the Double XLs. This is video footage of of that day. Greg, of course, rode the first wave out there, paddled in. This is Kelly Slater, the 10, almost 11 time world champion. This is Greg's brother, Russ, on a bomb. And he paid. And I, I would point out, you know, these guys are surfing over the, the hull of the Jalisco, so it, that ship provides a, a hazard kind of unlike most other surf spots I've ever seen anywhere. Peter Mel from Mavericks on a beauty. This is Chilean Ramon Navarro 
he was he was he had just surfed the Eddie Cal contest that Greg had actually won um, a, a few weeks earlier, and Ramon was a real crowd favorite. This is Nathan Fletcher, Flippy Hoffman's uh, great great nephew, and Nathan's generally regarded as just one of the best in the business today. And then uh, we had November 2nd, 2010. Um, initially, this swell was looking, that it, looking like a, a carbon copy of the 2008 swell, but it lost some of its push between Hawaii and California, but it was still gonna be really big. Um, this is Rob Brown's boat pulling up to a boat called the Condor. I got to go out on the, on, on the Condor at a very slow pace over these huge waves, and I was just having awful nightmares of, uh, I mean, I was like, as I was asleep, I was having these awful nightmares of being in a tsunami and an earthquake at the same time. And, um, and Greg and the boys had actually surfed Mavericks the day before, so they wanted to see if it was possible to surf Mavericks and then make it, and then make it down to, uh, to Cortez, and, and they proved that indeed it was. This is, this is, these are some shots that, that Jason took. This is, of course, you know, all bow. This is Jeff Clark, Mavericks founding father, um, who was out there not only surfing but running rescue for the boys. And, and uh, I might point out that Rob Brown and, and Jason Murray are, are both kind of lunatics in their own right. This is Jason with his camera perched in his lap. Um, you know, he goes there to get the shot, and uh, you sit there on Rob's boat out at Cortez, too, and you're just thinking, oh my gosh, I hope he knows what he's doing. This is uh, Shane Dorian, who has recently been, been been captured along with Greg and some of the boys paddling out at paddling into waves at Jaws, which was of course largely considered to be unpaddleable. This is him at Cortez. This is some video that I shot. This is this just gives you an idea of, of what it's like rolling towards the rolling towards the waves on Rob's boat. Oh come on. This was a toe surfing wave. They toe surfed the first part of the day. Snips. So I think that was Parsons. And everything is moving around out there, as you guys can see. It's just, it's, it's not like anywhere else I've ever been. And it's just so surreal to see this wave breaking out in the middle of the ocean like that. And then um, a few more photos, and then I'll finally let you guys uh, alone. This is Mark Healy, Greg's good friend from Hawaii, um, tucking into a barrel. And this is Jason shooting in the foreground. This is Shane Dorian, who uh, he's, he's looking, thinking twice on this one. And it's probably a good thing he did. <laughs> we could see Jason burst just right down there. And this is Shane broke his favorite board out there. And this is Jeff, Jeff Clark, um, who was running rescue. Jeff and Mike decided to run rescue for the boys who were paddling. And uh, basically, Greg you know, sort of said, if we hadn't had Greg and Mike, I mean, Jeff and Mike out there running lifeguard for us. I, I don't think it would have been a very wise thing to do. Now, um, again, the engineers in the crowd would find this really interesting. Um, two years ago, Jeff, when Shane, was it two years ago that Shane had his hole down at Mavericks? Um, two years ago, Shane nearly drowned at Mavericks. And he's a dad with, with at least one kid, two kids. Down on the bottom of the ocean, he kind of said to himself, something's got to change. Um, and so Shane actually thought to the idea of when you go on an airplane and you see the, the life jackets that you pull the thing and, the, and it hits the CO2 cartridge, he had the guys at Billabong rig him up a suit with a rip cord on it. So Shane went, went down on a huge wave and got ragdolled. And while he was 30 or 40 feet under, he pulled the cord and rocketed right back up to the surface. And uh, I think it's arguable that you're going to see this more and more as the guys are trying to paddle into waves that are bigger and bigger. And as, as Skin Dog has pointed out, Unless you're knocked out cold, this, is, this, is, this could really be a, a great life-saving invention. Um, this is Mark Healy from Maui, um, who's, uh, not Mark Healy, Ian Walsh from Maui, who's just an absolute charger. And you can see how blue the waves, they, they almost look inviting, but uh, not to me. Um, this is that same wave. And then you can see sometimes the waves just hit, you know, I don't know what it's hitting, but they hit these perturbations, these, these features underwater, and they just uh, erupt in the air. And often this distance, you can see another wave um, that, that nobody surfs because there's kind of no escape from it. Then this is Greg um, on a wave that kind of looks like a claw back behind him. And uh, we have one more photo. And this is Greg sitting out by himself in the middle of the ocean, 100 miles offshore. And he said to me, when you're paddling all alone out there, when you really look at the place and feel its immensity, 
you can't just help but you I should be you just can't help but feel that there's something so much greater so much more significant at work than you and uh, and this is me and Mike Parsons and the king of Babylonia, Jim Houts and Greg Long. Jim actually went with us on that mission, and uh, and he was he was he really had a great time. It was his first time going back out to Cortez since he nearly died aboard his great ship. And uh, so, I hope you guys will enjoy the book. I hope you enjoyed this. <laughs> and do we have time for these guys to come up and take some questions? I. I'd be honored if you guys would take the bench and maybe uh, if you guys have any questions for them. These are the, these are the guys that were my, my primary sources of information. Hmm? And introduce them again. And what? Introduce them oh. so you know who they are. Uh, okay. Thank you, April Whitney, for policing me. I appreciate it. Greg Long, Ken Skin Dog Collins, photographer Jason Murray, Jeff Clark, photographer Rob Brown. And uh, thank you guys for everything. <laughs> So um, I'm not a, a surfer really, but I went to Mavericks out on the ocean a couple of years ago, and I was struck by how close it, close the break is. You know, like if, if you're like 100 yards away or 200 yards away, there's the swells are way way smaller than the waves that you're surfing. It looks like this is different. Like it looks like the the breaks are just way bigger. The waves are bigger for wider periods of time. Is that right? That's what really separates, I mean, every big wave is kind of unique into itself, the bathymetry, you know, the bottom contours, which in turn direct the swell direction into, you know, either breaking, as in Mavericks, uh, it's a very um, consistent kind of reef bottom, uh, not over an expansive area, so the waves are consistently in the same place, um, you know, relatively speaking, where Cortez Bank, as we mentioned, it's, you know, an underwater, uh, you know, sea mountain island that's been sunk in. And waves can break over the expanse of you know 12 to 15 miles, and the actual shallowest part of the reef uh, extends about a mile long. Uh, whereas Mavericks, I think uh, Jeff can you know test the actual yeah, reef that's breaking on us over the course of you know maybe 25 <coughs> yards as far as the yeah Mavericks there. comes up much more abruptly, where the the it gradually comes up at Cortez Bank. Mavericks it it. Uh, because it comes up so abruptly, the waves, when they talked about the, the swell slamming into the reef, it, it is so abrupt, which is why Mavericks is so hard to ride in a different way than Cortez. It, it hits the reef and jumps out of the ocean to where it actually whips the top of the wave over. And Cortez Bank, um, it comes up smoother, so the breaking area, if a wave, it comes up smoother to that final break point. Um, but that lends itself to being a much bigger playing field in and out by 100 yards. And um, you can kind of be in no man's land. So when we were caddying for Greg and Healy and Shane and Parsons, and uh, it was over a, a football field or more of area. and. Just, it, it was fun trying to trying to use our instinct to go. Maybe I should, he's in too far. Or maybe I should go get him, pull him out. And, you know, so it was exciting though. Skinny. Yeah, I was gonna say that um, on the coast of California, the swells hit the continental shelf and it really slows them down. Where at Cortez Banks, there's no continental shelf. It just hits it directly. So one thing you'll notice right off the bat is the waves faster, way faster. I mean, the fact that these guys went out there and tried to paddle it is like borderlines crazy um <laughs> so you'll notice that it just comes in and you ride the wave and it feels like you're flying twice as fast it's like no other thing and um and trying to track it down is that much more difficult we're in the all through california the swells hit the continental shelf and some places it's not as far but it totally slows it down to a you know a way more manageable speed i might point out you know some of you guys might wonder how fast those waves are are going um I, I, I can't say this definitively, but I mean, one of a big wave sweeping over Cortez um, is has been slowed a bit, but it's the wave itself is probably moving between 45 and 50 miles an hour, if not faster. Um, and that's a big one, like the on this 2008 swell. And then you take the the surfers are moving at 25 to 30 miles over that, so they're moving at the speed of a super G skier, basically going going down these waves, and so that introduces a whole new set of of hydrodynamic issues. 
just curious, these big waves, do they too, do you get a green room effect or do they close out faster? Seems like all the footage just shows it closed out by you saw Greg. Yeah, again, every wave is unique into itself. I mean, there's no two waves that are ever the same, no two swells. Um, it has a lot to do with the wind, the current, where you know, a break like Mavericks, as Jeff was saying, uh, it comes out of deep water to a real abrupt, uh, shallow shelf, and you'll get a consistent, you know, barreling wave where other, um, you know, waves, it just depends on the bottom contours, whereas we mentioned Cortez, it's kind of this gradual, you know, sloping shelf where it'll tend to sort of topple over at the top and then sort of roll over itself. So it just depends on the bottom contours, but there are some waves, um, you know, another one I'm sure you guys have heard of uh, called Jaws uh, Peahi over in Maui, where that's an actual perfect reef and it is, you know, a 60, 70 foot, you know, barrel, you know, down the entire length of the reef. So it just depends on the bottom contours which shape the, uh, the form of the wave. And Cortez does barrel sometimes. It's generally more on the inside, as you saw in that wave that, that, that Greg rode. The, the wave will come into the inside and it'll slam certain parts of the shelf and just throw out. Uh, I just moved here from Hawaii uh, a couple months ago. I remember watching the AI Cal years ago, and it was just it was insane. Like, the first time I just took a barrel right on shore and just got destroyed. Like, what's White Mayo like compared to these places? Let's take that. Uh, what, that, what is Waimea like compared to Cortez or Mavericks? Well, yeah, on, uh, when, when Waimea is big, it seems like if the swell's just right, you can get waves as close to as big as Mavericks or Cortez, but Cortez and Mavericks, there's no limit to how big. You know, Waimea's in a small bay, and... You know, these open ocean waves have much greater opportunity for a much bigger swell to be good. There's actually, I mean, scientific calculations as far as how deep the channel is, you know, how deep the water is off to the side of the reef, which will, you know, in turn dictate how big a wave can actually, you know, hold its shape and be surfable before it closes out and just becomes one successive white water. Um, you know, where Waimea, you know, anything over about 50 feet on the face, it starts to close out the bay and, and basically become, you know, an unsurfable wave. Where Cortez Bank, you know, right off the side, you know, drops into, you know, thousands of feet of water. Uh, Mavericks, I think it's close to, you know, 100 feet right off the side, which, you know, in turn, um, there's been a couple of, you know, uh, surf documentaries, you know, um, that explain all this. You know, Mavericks can hold, you know, close to a 100-foot wave. You know, Cortez Bank hypothetically would would never close out. Could hold you know a wave up to you know three four hundred feet high. If, but um, the reality of actually getting a swell to produce uh, you know significant wave heights to make it that big, it's not very realistic. But um, you know, Cortez, uh, Jaws, and Mavericks are the three kind of prominent big waves that actually have the potential to hold a hundred foot wave. Yeah, since we're talking three and four hundred foot waves, I think Cortez <laughs> might be too shallow. <laughs> the wave would just buckle. <laughs> there was that wave off the coast of France that some pictures got submitted for the XXL a few Belhara. years ago. Yeah, that's Belhara. It was huge, but it was kind of like this. And is that still like, a place to be you know, discovered more? Or what's going on there? The question was about the, this wave, Belhara, which is a huge wave off the coast of France. Maybe I'd let Jeff or, or Skinny um, take that question, because it is a huge wave. In all reality, there's going to be more waves being discovered because this is fairly you know new as a sport like hey let's find the biggest waves there's people kind of find the best waves now we're looking for the biggest waves and uh, <laughs> right now actually garrett mcnamara is in portugal and he's on a project and they're pretty confident they're going to find one of the biggest waves in the world there um but yeah when the reef is at a certain level of depth and certain gradual it won't stand up as straight like a building mavericks is pretty much straight as a building you could be at the bottom and you can look straight up on it Cortez, a little more slow, but still super strong. France, it's like, seriously, it's not that. It's dangerous, <laughs> but doesn't it just doesn't have the impact of a, that a, a building that Mavericks has. It doesn't get respect amongst big wave aficionados either that other waves do. Because, yeah, because exactly. it's so slopey. So. You know, and all that takes is a bigger wave because a bigger wave would drag more of that energy, it'd stop it, and you'd have more going over the top to actually make it break for like a real wave, but we haven't seen that 200-foot swell. Yeah, we're looking for those the, giant storms the really, from the 40s or 60s or whatnot. It's just too deep. The reef's probably th you know 25 to 30 feet deep, so the wave actually never grounds enough to stop the base and topple over. You had a question? Yeah, I was going to ask, how do they go about actually measuring these waves? 
the question was how do you go about measuring these waves, and that's a contentious issue. Jason, it is, it is a contentious that? issue, um, and it's a pretty inexact science too. Most you'd be surprised. It's a bunch of guys in a room with with some calipers and beers and um, and some beers and pizza, and they go, okay, well let's try and identify the base of the wave, judging from the photographic evidence. They they say here's the base, and then we'll look at the the crest of the wave, and they'll measure, you know, by by using the human scale in the way, in the photo. And, and kind of um, and calculate from that, but it's not the most scientific, and you'll have different angles produce different size um, photos if, if, uh, or different size looking waves. If you were to take this um, particular photo here on the cover and you shot it more from, from head on, the wave could look 30% larger uh, versus shooting something from the air that might flatten out the, the photo. So it's, there's, there's quite a bit of subjectivity, and then it also depends a lot on the angle of where it's shot from. And, and um, and How such. Many beers had. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How small the guy looks. If, if he's crouching down, yep. If, you know, if he's if he's in a squat, you know, he's make about it look six bigger. foot tall. You make a little bit more. You start at the bottom. You start going one, two, three, four. Yeah. So it's not a hundred percent accurate. But that is literally how it's judged for the XXLs. So you guys are big wave surfers. Um, what's your favorite wave, though? I mean, are there waves where you're like double overhead in J-Bay, I'd have as much fun doing that as I would on this? Or is it just big wave is so much different and so much better for you that you would rather have that? So a good shape versus huge wave. Um, I personally like surfing every single day. It doesn't matter how small, how big. Um, that you know, I can find a challenge even on a you know, windy two-foot day you know, if you go out there with the right mindset. And just being in the ocean is, is what brings me my, you know, satisfaction, you know, my passion in life. Um, granted, you know, I love surfing big waves uh, more. Obviously, the excitement, the exhilaration, the gratification that comes from that uh, surpasses that of small waves. But, you know, we only get, yeah, we only get, um, you know, a, a handful of days of big waves a year. So if you only, you know, dedicated or said, I'm only going to surf big waves, you'd be uh, missing out on a lot of fun, uh, you know, opportunities to you know, be in the water otherwise. That was so vague. Um, <laughs> here's the deal. Big wave surfing is um, it's spiritual, too. You get a lot of like serious satisfaction out of riding a big wave. Toe surfing, not so much. You can toe into anything. And everybody knows that it's just luck. You know, you get towed in. I found out halfway through it, it's kind of like not satisfying. It's like, you're going, all right, I did another one. I did but another it's one. really fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nothing wrong with it. And you can get barrel, but grabbing... Your surfboard and paddling out to a spot and catching it with your bare hands is way more satisfying than anything I've ever experienced in my life. And I, I kind of gave up toe surf and went back to just paddling because, I, you know, you catch a 50-foot wave on a jet ski, it's like, all right, that's cool. You catch a 15-foot wave on a board, you're all, <laughs> your heart's in your throat. It's scary. And you remember every little thing about catching that wave with your hands. It's, it's like branded into your brain. It's, you'll never forget any part of it. Jeff, do you want to tell them why we have these two boards and what the differences are? Because we have this one huge, you know, two these huge boards. One is Greg's uh, paddle surfing board, and another is a toe surfing board. They might be interested in knowing why these boards look so different. Um, one's the wakeboard board. <laughs> wakeboard. <laughs> for, no, it's a toe surfing board. It's shaped to go really fast, ride big waves. Um, the paddle and surfboard. This is Greg's board. Is this like the one you won the Mavericks contest on? Yeah. So. Um, this board is built to, to be large enough to get your paddling speed up to catch that wave and make the drop before you get thrown to the beach. Um, you, need to, you need to find that perfect mix for you that is the right size, and once you catch the wave, have the maneuverability. The little boards are a lot more maneuverable, but you can't catch a wave with them. And with Mavericks being probably the premier paddle and surf spot in the world, um, we're really refining what we're building for the guys to ride the waves. Um, go. Perfect example. Um, that's Greg Long's board. That's my board. Greg Long has a supermodel, super sexy, super thin. <laughs> I got a big fat chick over here. <laughs> I find out they feel way better, and I catch way more waves on a big board. And I'm seeing a whole trend of boards going from being, I know that's pretty bad, huh? <laughs> um, but it, his board's probably under three inches. That one's almost five inches thick. And um, I just got to the point where I'm going, you know, I don't care what it looks like. I want to catch these waves. And you, you no matter how good a shape you are, how fast you are and stuff, you're running into, you know, even on that board, I'm paddling for waves and maybe not catching it. And um, 
you're going to see that happening. Boards will go smaller, but you'll see boards get bigger and thicker and find that the ceiling because they found the ceiling how thin you can go. You can't go thinner than two and a half. They haven't found the ceiling on these other boards. <laughs> um, and I've seen guys on stand up paddle boards actually catch waves at Mavericks and made my head go, oh my God, if he can ride a wave on that long board that has no design technology whatsoever. What can I do on a board that actually has some technology and that girth? So that's what we're seeing. And, and that's why I got this board I built for myself because I'm doing a lot of stand-up paddling, riding big waves and stand-up paddle boards. And I'm thinking, you know what? My big stand-up paddle board turns really well on a big wave. So I'm going to use what I learned in shaping guns, transfer it to the volume of a stand-up paddle board, and you know, with what Kenny wants to do and what all the big wave wants, guys want to do is paddle into the biggest bomb they could find. So volume, speed, and, and then incorporate the maneuverability you need to survive that, you know, make that takeoff, set your line, you know, do what you, be maneuverable enough to escape. <laughs> Hang on, with that said, I would love to challenge you guys that are engineers to take a look at these boards and actually possibly give us some more feedback because I don't think the smartest people in the world are making these boards. No offense. <laughs> really good craftsmanship, but I would love to see what some of your brains could come Tell up with. Tell me that after this winter. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what clicks in you to start surfing the big wave? Like, I do shoulder high indicators and I pee my wetsuit. <laughs> The question was, how did these guys get into this wave, uh, you know, get into surfing these, these big waves like this? For me, it was, as I started little, it just became a natural progression to go to the next size, to the next size, to the next size, and pretty soon I was surfing by myself. Yeah, Rob should have some good input, because Rob's they're, not a big wave surfer. Yeah, I want to no, hear what I, Rob They're has. mental cases. They, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's natural, though. They, I used to surf, and the only reason I started photographing the big waves is because I I knew I couldn't survive it, and I had so much respect for it. And these guys, definitely, they, they start, and next thing you know, it's not enough for them. There's kind of no limit, and they have to, to keep growing and get to that point. But definitely, they're, there's a, it's not so much a screw loose, it's just different. They, they just are comfortable amongst it, and then they just grow and get bigger and bigger, and next thing you know, they're at the level they're at now. But you have to really, really want it, <laughs> really, really want it bad. I think some people would argue, Greg might agree, that, that you know, Jason and, and Jason has surfed Mavericks before, I might point out. Rob is more sane like me. But you could also, I mean, I've seen Rob on his boat do things that, that, that leave Greg kind of slack-jawed. And so, you know, it's the same sort of thing. Rob's really comfortable with his boat, you know, and, and Jason is really comfortable run, doing photos and running rescue on the ski. So, they, you know, there's, there is a level of comfort that you, that you get. But, man, I mean, when it I... It is, it is different, as Rob said. I guess um, you know, what I think it really comes down to is you know, anything that you really love or passionate about in life, there's that constant pursuit to better yourself and continue to challenge yourself. Where, um, you know, there was a time when, you know, as you were saying, a you know, shoulder waist high wave, you know, I was peeing myself too. You know, I obviously grew up uh, in the water from a young age, and you know, it was when I was about you know, 9, 10 years old. But um, you do anything for long enough, and you learn kind of how to figure out, become more comfortable. And like I said, it's just that mindset of you know, always wanting to con uh, continue to improve. And um, you know, I'm sure you know, skinny Jeff can attest. You know, as you you know continue to sort of push yourself, um, you know, it becomes this sort of obsession to actually see you know physically and mentally you know what it is you're actually capable of. And you know that's led us to uh, you know this constant pursuit. And now you know as we're spending more time uh, surfing big waves and had this whole toe surfing revolution going back refining our equipment we're realizing that you know we really haven't you know tapped into our fullest potential and uh you know we only get so many days of big waves a year so it's kind of a slow progression and uh you know, we're still learning you know and it's a significant amount every single year well you know i have a kid now i have a couple and i personally think it's genes um <laughs> you ever go to the park and you ever see the kids in the park you see that one kid climbing on the top of the monkey gym and jumping off that's candidate for your Maverick surfer or any big wave That's surfer. That's your kid, right? Yeah. Same guys that are up at snowboarding. You're seeing a little kid, and he's going, oh, my God, that kid's not scared of going down the black diamond. Kind of that same gene pool. Yeah, it, and it, it also, the more your relationship grows with the ocean and, you know, the better you get, it becomes kind of a, 
you, you have goals that you sign a set for yourself and wow, I pulled that off, you know, I want to do it again. And, and then surfing bigger waves and, you know, and then just the, you know, whether it's two foot or 20 foot, just being in the ocean, I mean, that's my favorite place to watch a sunset is in the water. Um, it becomes uh, just, you know, part of your world and, you know, it's, you'll take it any way you can get it. The question was, has anybody ever tried Shane Dorian's inflatable wetsuit? On order. <laughs> Skinny said on order. We're, we're still waiting to get all of ours. Um, I was in kind of doing the uh, research and development with him with the uh, wetsuit developer. And it was an idea that, you know, we'd all been talking about for years. And, I mean, it, it really isn't, you know, rocket science technology. Um, but it just actually took somebody being pushed to that limit and finally saying it's time that we do this because it, it will in fact save lives in, in the future. Um, and you know, in recent years, you know, we've all lost you know, a couple of our you know, closest friends and something of that sort you know, could have easily had saved their lives. Um, so you know, it's something that will be implemented on a regular basis on the big days in the future. Somebody had one at Chopu, Rob was asking. Yeah. Um, another thing that's going on, too, is we're implementing, there's a um, canister, it's called Extreme uh, Air, it's from kayakers, and it's a can of air with 15 breaths, compressed air, and you can put it on your chest, it's pretty amazing, and I feel with the pool and the air, you could actually go to some place like Cortez and survive something you normally wouldn't survive without that equipment. And one of the things that we really need to get changed as well is the PWC band because they're the cleanest craft in the ocean, and this NOAA law that banned them is just wrong. And, and they, they, have, they made their mind up before they ever had our, the hearings to hear us, and when they heard us, they said thank you and passed the law anyway. And now we've, uh, we had one guy that made it, and then last year we lost a guy because we were afraid of ticketing and didn't have our rescue skis in the lineup where they should have been. And I might point out that, that it, Jacob, is that the guy that Jacob was rescued? Jacob, was rescued. Jacob, who was rescued, was rescued with the help of a ski. Um, My ski? J skinny ski. I, I went out there and I just, I, I'm going out there with a the ski regardless. I'll take the ticket. I just told myself I want to have a rescue team supporting me. Um, to answer that question, how that happened, some guys didn't like the fat guys were toe surfing Mavericks. There was a bit of an argument between two groups of surfers, paddle groups and toe surfing. At this point, that's gone. We don't want to toe surf Mavericks anymore. We just want the jet skis there to survive uh, for rescue. Um, a couple guys that knew the Surf Rider Foundation kind of chimed in, made it happen. This thing got railroaded through no problem without any kind of scientific proof that they're bad for the environment, bad for the uh, animals, um, annoying towards people. That's basically why it was. It was just annoying people. I, I saw an article just recently, and they were using data from 15 years ago. All that's changed, and it's no more two strokes. I mean, they were also using data too from like Lake Havasu. Oh, there's 57,000 accidents in the lake. And like, yeah, well, they're not banned in the lakes. They're banned in the ocean when there's only probably about maybe 30 jet skis on the whole coast of California that want to go out and support guys surfing. Um, in all lifeguard situations, Hawaii, everywhere right now, everyone has a life, uh, jet ski. It's the ultimate water safety rescue. If a boat goes down in the ocean, they send in a jet ski with a, with a rescue sled on the back with a two-man team to save the people that are in danger. I mean, there's not a better water safety craft in the world right now. Sure. With that, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Yeah.